Hi, Joanna. Hello, Rosemary. Nice How are you doing? I'm <laughs> very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yes. Yeah. So, I just had a lovely lunch. Oh, nice. I, uh, yeah, I was enjoying the weather earlier, but it seems a little bit overcast again, so. Yeah, it's a little overcast here. But at least it isn't tipping down. You, which you have blue is. skies behind you. Oh, I always have blue skies behind me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least it isn't tipping down. Apparently it's tipping down in Devon, or it was tipping down in Devon. I'm, 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 I'm not sure. But it was. It was. So we... Um, We've got might, the attendees, I can see. Yeah, I think we might as well um, make a start. So just to introduce Joanna to everyone. Um, Joanna is a martial arts expert. I love you in your your outfit. I can't remember the record. That's terrible. Um, she's 20 years experience of practicing and teaching martial arts to kids and adults. But is that just Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or do you do other styles as well? No, it's it's been a bunch of different martial arts uh, throughout my life, beginning with kickboxing, judo, uh -huh. aikido. Uh -huh. I pretty much trained everything and what was out there <laughs> to discover what was the most effective set one, just out of curiosity. So that's across different, a whole spectrum of different martial arts. Mm. Yeah. And is the Jiu Jitsu your favorite? I think so. It's the most complex and the most challenging by far from all of the arts I've practiced. So this is the mm -hmm. one I kind of tend to resonate towards. And also I see very big application for self-defense for that martial mm -hmm. art. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm kind of sticking to it at the moment, focusing on it. Okay, so let's come back. Um, Joanna is absolutely passionate about delivering self-defense workshops across a wide range of um, different sectors and today she's going to share her knowledge and experience um, in a workshop that will discuss legal aspects of physical defense but also will include some demonstrations um, of practical intervention so if you've got any questions for Joanna um, obviously just pop them in the chat box or if you like in the Q&A box or if you are um, on Facebook, so I know it's live in different pages on the Facebook chat or even messages. That's fine as well. If you send a message to Think Tree Help, we can pick that up. So, Joanna, over to you. Really looking forward to it. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And hello, everyone. I uh, welcome you this afternoon uh, into the self defense workshop. Uh, we, can, we have 45 minutes to go through some of the theoretical parts, but also looking at some of the physical interventions, as Rosemary mentioned. So thank you for joining me, because I think it's perhaps now more than ever so important to look after our personal safety um, in everyday life, really, not just in our line of work that we do, uh, but also when we're out there in the street by ourselves, when we travel, um, just to pay attention to our circumstance and bringing aware, really, of what's happening around us to make sure we are safe. So today I'll share a short presentation with you and share the agenda. So let me share my screen. I'm just going to pop my PowerPoint over here. So just bear with me. And with regards to any questions that you may have, uh, I have left a little bit of time by the end of this uh, workshop to answer all your questions. So I may not be able to immediately answer the questions as, as they come through the chat or through the comments box, but I will take that time to answer them uh, by the end. Okay. Okay, so let's share my screen. <clears throat> All right, so just as we begin a little bit about myself, Rosemary has already shared that I'm a martial artist with around 20 years experience. And this is both um, coaching, practicing, but also teaching uh, martial arts um, to adults, to kids, to different groups, different sectors. Um, so as you can imagine, there were different corporate groups um, that wanted to run self-defense workshops, um, minorities, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole range, whole range of um, different people and also asking different questions. Um, with regards to self-defense and why I started 
self-defense workshops. Um, it wasn't actually until I fell victim of an assault myself that I started to pay a little bit more attention towards physical defense as it applies in the streets. So being a martial artist, you can imagine you always have that safety zone where you have a referee in a competition. You can always give up. <laughs> uh, you can always, you know, end the match uh, without inflicting any pain or injury upon yourself. Um, however, when it comes to the street or when it comes to situations where we don't have other people around us to help us, it's not necessarily so straightforward. So this is where my passion began and I started studying. I started studying uh, and analyzing some of the statistical data. I started interviewing people that were victims of assault like myself uh, to try and figure out what are the cornerstones of physical defense. As you can imagine, it's not just pure uh, ability to use force against somebody, but also a lot about the circumstances surrounding the case. Um, so just presenting you with a short agenda for today. First, a very important point is um, the law with regards to self-defense as it stands in the UK. Why is it important? Um, a lot of us are a little bit skeptical about using force, um, using you know physical fighting. Um, purely because of the impl legal implications and what could this amount to, can amount to an assault. So I'm going to take a little bit of time just to show you and explain uh, how the law protects you as a citizen from defending yourself in, in these type of scenarios. We will discuss some use cases. I'll give you examples uh, of how using force can be excused. Later on, I'll also address the issue of awareness. So being aware of your surroundings and how best to avoid conflict in the first place. We also discussed some of the safety measures. Uh, so what can be done in the first instance when a situation of conflict arises, how to best de-escalate, how to use your voice and body language to avoid conflict. And later on, we'll go into a physical demonstration. So I'll have my assistant help me to show you some of the basic moves that we can employ uh, when faced with conflict. And later, as I mentioned, we have about five minutes uh, to answer any of your questions that you may have. So without further ado, I'm going to present you with the theoretical part first um, and discuss some of the legal aspects of physical defense. So before we go into the details, this is just a interpretation of what uh, physical defense is, the definition of it. So it is the defensive use of physical force for the purpose of preventing an actual or imminent threat of unlawful violence against the person with the aim of creating a window of opportunity to escape the threat. I love this definition uh, because it really encapsulates a lot of the themes around self-defense. As you can see, uh, it's use, use of physical force, it's in prevention, but also imminent threat. So what it actually means, it's not just in the moment of being attacked that you're able to use force, but also to prevent anything from happening. And you can also apply force in order to prevent any, any harmful behavior. And also the second really nice aspect of this definition is that we need to do everything we can, everything in our power to prevent and escape the threat. So it's not actually staying in the conflict situation, but it's actually taking ourselves away from the situation. So really just buying ourselves a little bit of time, enough time to run away, to escape to safety. And this is our uh, legal duty, which I will discuss in a next slide as well. So in the section 3.1 of the Criminal Law Act 1967, we read that in their interpretation, rights of all citizens to use force in their defense on the defense of others in the prevention of crime based on the fact that any infliction of force upon another person may amount to an assault against the person and such as a crime so this is the concern most people have a lot of the times when i teach uh, moves in my workshop pe people come and ask me well if i hit somebody like that or if i react this way this amounts to an assault so i can be you know, I can be um, actually sued for it. Um, well, yes, in theory, you could be sued, but there are laws around that that will protect you. And we're going to look at what is be going to be considered. So before we go into the legal excuses of physical force, 
this is should be obvious to uh, to all of us. Um, this is just a description of where we should not use force. Uh, it is for instances of revenge, retaliation, retribution, or even teaching people a lesson, of course. Uh, in that circumstance, the physical force will not be excused. So if these circumstances are inexcusable, what is an excusable force? Well, again, here we're coming to the British law. The use of force against a person may be justified or excused in law in these three circumstances. One, to prevent or terminate a crime. And this is governed by the Criminal Law Act 1967. Two, to prevent or terminate the lawful detention of oneself or another. This is also governed by the common law. Most people assume physical defense. Someone is attacking me, I'm defending. Not only this situation can amount to physical defense, as you can imagine, in situations where you're being detained against your will, and whether it's a hotel room or maybe therapy room or wherever where you practice or where you find yourself in um, by yourself with a person one-on-one -on -one, or even with more people, whenever there is an action against you um, in order to detain you, you can also use physical force against that person even though there, are not, there is no imminent physical harm, but there is potential harm that can be as a, a result of that detention. The third point here mentions um, prevention and terminating the breach of peace governed by the common law. An example of a breach of peace is someone entering your premises without um, your knowledge or without your uh, consent. So we have these three legal excuses. Now, when a case goes to court, if you're being sued for using, uh, using physical defense, what's going to be taken into consideration is what we call an honestly held belief. And the general approach to that is that the force can be used as is reasonable in the circumstances. That's a very important sentence, reasonable in the circumstances, but also as the defendant believes them to be, even if the belief is a mistaken one, or even if that mistake is an unreasonable one. So what it actually means is that we use our better judgments. So whatever is happening to us, we interpret through our own lens, okay? Um, and then we, one person, it may differ from one person to another. Uh, I may feel that some, someone is a threat to me while another person may not feel that. So it really is down to my judgment of that person and their um, intentions. So if a jury thought that in a moment of unexpected anguish, a person attacked had only done what they honestly and instinctively thought was necessary, that would be the most potent evidence that only reasonable defense action had been taken. This is an interpretation from Palmer. So as you can see, the judge is always gonna look at what that person honestly thought was happening. Okay, two themes around honestly held belief that will be very important. First, what is reasonable in the circumstances? Well, the force that we used, first of all, must be necessary to prevent the crime. So when we say what is necessary, what we mean by that is we have a duty to avo avoid conflict as citizens. So if there is a window of opportunity for us to run away, to de-escalate, or to do anything else to prevent this from happening, we should always take that route in the first instance. If it's impossible, then we can look at other options. Second principle will apply to the level of proportionality. So what does it actually mean? If we do use force, what amounts to a proportional force? Well, as you can see here on this slide, the standard is best defined in terms of what is reasonably proportionate to the amount of harm likely to be suffered by the defendant or likely to result if the forcible intervention is not made. So what we mean by that? If I'm preventing some greater harm from happening, yes, maybe I will use, well, maybe I will need to use physical defense and hurt somebody. But if that's a lesser evil, then that is still within that proportionality rule, okay? So we have two aspects of necessity and proportionality. So now, and we have an example here just to demonstrate what proportionality rule really is. I'll just read out this slide and try to figure out in your heads whether the person responsible for their action could potentially go to court. A 15 year old boy is located in a children's ward situated on the fourth floor of a hospital. The boy attempts to jump out of the window 
and below him is a concrete pavement, which is seriously going to injure or even possibly kill him. The staff attempt to stop him and in doing so end up by accident breaking the boy's arm. Now, what do you think that the staff's action have been proportionate in so much as the harm caused to the boy, um, sorry, as the harm caused to the boy prevented a greater harm from occurring? It should be obvious, maybe not immediately, that the action is proportionate because if the action is not taken, then the boy is likely to suffer a serious injury or even die. So obviously this, this action was just to prevent a greater harm from happening. And this depicts the, lev the level of proportionality really, really well. So just to encapsulate what I've mentioned and kind of um, create like a nice package for, for your legal principle here. First of all, we have to ask ourselves, is the force necessary? And if so, how much force can we use? Now, first of all, just to mention again and recap that we have to demonstrate the unwillingness to fight. And this is a consistent with the legal duty to avoid conflict. How? By disengaging, by leaving, if this is possible option to be taken. Now, there are some exceptions. For example, if we have a duty to stay, that's another thing. If the force is um, applied, then we have to adhere to the level of proportionality. So whether the force is proportionate. And lastly, the use of force may include a use of preemptive strike, provided again, that there is a duty to avoid conflict. So preemptive strike could be prevention. Um, for example, if someone is dragging you somewhere into a place and you're feeling, genuinely feeling, your honestly held belief is that this person is about to detain you and cause serious harm to you, you can prevent this from happening by using kicks, using punches, using whatever you believe is necessary to prevent that harm from happening, okay? So it doesn't mean that this person is immediately hurting you, uh, but you need to act using physical force in order to prevent it from happening. So this is what we call preemptive strike. We preemptively trying to take ourselves away. But remember, if there is a, an opportunity to run, this always this is the route that always should be taken. So these are the legal principles to be aware of. And just make sure that you understand it because the law will protect you. If you truly believe someone is assaulting you, someone is really going to harm you, this will be in the judge's eyes and that potent evidence that you're only using reasonable force. Now, with regards to awareness, it really breaks down to precautions and what we are actually planning ahead. Um, if we're meeting clients first time or maybe meeting clients in, in their house one-to-one, -one, really paying attention whether there are other people in the building, whether there's anyone we can um, ask for help if needed. Just being aware also when you're walking the street, it doesn't have to be in the therapy room, but also outside, because as we know, assaults can happen everywhere. So just being aware of your surroundings is the first step to avoid conflict altogether. And that could be a few different things. One is to just look around when you're walking the street, maybe without looking at your phone, maybe without uh, your um, headphones, something like that, just to pay attention to your surroundings. As you can see here on this slide, I put a picture. Uh, we filmed this scene when I was walking around the corner and I was cutting the corner uh, and I was really surprised by that person jumping out of the corner and I didn't see it coming. This is one um, example uh, that really pictures it very well. If I was to walk a little bit away from, more away from the, that corner, I would have probably had enough time to react. But here I'm cutting the corner and I'm not really paying attention and to what may be behind that corner. So this, again, that awareness piece that can save me altogether. Second very important aspect when you're walking out in the streets is your posture and eye contact. A lot of the times potential victims um, that are being targeted are either not paying attention, maybe on their phones and looking quite vulnerable. So what looking vulnerable really means is that you know, you don't seem very confident. Maybe um, you're a little bit wobbly, maybe tipsy, maybe not really giving that assertiveness um, sign. Now, if your posture changes, if your body language changes, 
that could already send a very big signal to the potential perpetrator not to approach you because you will be able to assertively, um, you know, actually defend yourself. Later on, uh, we'll also look at distance control and I will demonstrate how to control your distance. But a general rule of thumb is that with this is our safety zone, okay? So if someone comes anywhere closer, we should already pay attention and try and use everything we can to bring this person away. So there's few things to mention. Escape routes is one of them. So whether we are in a therapy room or whether we're in the street, we always have to think, what are the exit routes? Is there any way I can run? And, and if so, where would I run? What's, where's the exit? So always trying to pay attention, especially if you're by yourself, to where is the route to safety? Later on, we also have a look at using improvised weapons uh, in the worst case scenarios. I've also put uh, using voice as a weapon. This is one of the most powerful things apart from your body language itself is to assert yourself and respect your boundaries by using your voice and very clearly stating what is it that you don't want. And oftentimes the not, um, using my own example, many times people would approach me in the street and I truly didn't want to converse, I didn't want to engage, clearly by stating my intentions in a very clear way and oftentimes repeating myself, the person would just simply go away. So I know from experience, this small trick really does work and assertiveness is, it can save you from trouble a lot of the times. So stance and voice, we'll look at that in a demonstration that I'm going to do in a minute. So in the demonstration, I'll share with you some of the simple moves, simple uh, blocks you can use in order to deflect conflict. Um, a lot of people think that using fists is a good idea. I personally disagree. I think using palms, palm strike is a little bit more effective because it's relatively safe. It creates a lot of distance control and also it's leverage based. So, so as you will see, and you can also already see in the picture here, it is a way to push someone and break their posture. So using the heel of the palm, this bottom side of the palm is really, really effective in a defense scenario. In terms of vulnerable parts of the body, there are few quite a few on the human body. So when it does come to an actual physical conflict, um, there are a few areas that I will mention briefly here. We won't discuss all of them, but just to focus on the most common ones, the throat is a very vulnerable part of the body. Chin, right, the space right underneath the nose and the eyes. So this is looking at upper body. Later on the right-hand side, you have few areas on the chest like the sternum and the liver, but we're actually going to focus on the groin area, which is the most common one. And looking at lower body, there are also some parts that are vulnerable, such as the knee, the shin, and the uh, front of the foot over here on the left-hand side picture. Um, and this could apply to a situation maybe when someone's grabbing you from behind and you're wearing high heels, you can also use the high heels maybe against the shin, against the knee. And even kicks in the knee can be very harmful indeed. In terms of the head, the back of the neck is a vulnerable part, but also the ears. And this is um, something I don't usually teach until I get to the last part of the workshop, which is the worst case scenarios when you're being pinned to the wall or to the floor in a way that is not allowing you to, for any strikes. This is also an area on the human body that can be especially harmful if you twist someone's ears. And this is just as harmful as grabbing the throat or putting your fingers in somebody, someone's eyes. Okay, so in the demonstration, I will focus on three parts of the body, which is the knees, elbows, and the palm strikes. In these um, strikes, there is very little harm that can be caused to your body, but there can be grievous bodily harm caused to the other person you're defending against. And before we go to the physical demonstration, I just wanted to also share the statistical data with you. Most of the offenses happen actually by someone that we know or that we've met cross paths with. And this is just to bring back that awareness to you that a lot of the times, any type of stalking on harassment offense will happen from the person that you've already met. 
as you can see, the statistics are very high from 23,000 have gone to 64,000. So there's a big rise in those numbers, um, probably due to social media, maybe also because people report it a little bit more often, but this is just giving you, um, you know, this um, kind of awareness that these people are probably going to be someone that you've met with, you've met before. And the last slide here that I've um, not have mentioned yet before, but if you are in a therapy room and you feel unsafe and to the degree that you like to call out for help and there is no one else in the building, what you can do, you can put your phone on mute um, and you can still have the phone, um, not on airplane mode, just on mute and have the phone next to you somewhere. So in the, in the situation of danger, you can actually press uh, for five seconds, the panic button, uh, sorry, the volume button. And that will trigger a response where all your emergency contacts, which you set up on your phone, will receive a text message with your current location. And they will notify your emergency contacts that you are in danger. So you have friends around that could come and help you or pick you up. They would immediately be notified of that situation. So I um, advise you, if you haven't used it, um, set up your emergency contacts on your phone. Okay, so now we're coming into the demonstration section of the workshop. Okay, so I'll have my assistant help me uh, to demonstrate a few moves. Okay, so I'm just going to move the camera. All right. So hopefully you can, you can see us from here. Okay. So now we're going to discuss, this is Isabella, my assistant. <laughs> we train together so she knows what she's doing. Uh, so today, first of all, we'll discuss distance control. So first of all, whenever in a situation of danger, you have to think about your personal safe uh, space. So as I mentioned, personal space is somewhere where I can reach my hands. If someone comes a little bit closer than this space, I want to bring my hands up to already frame. Well, we, this is what we, uh, we call a frame because my arms are already up and this by itself in an international language interpreted in every country in the same way is a sign to de-escalate. So if you ever have a case that goes to court, the judge always looks at the CCTV camera. Um, I'm just gonna bring the screen up because I noticed I have to stop sharing here. All right, there you go. So you can see me on a bigger screen. So this sign by, is interpreted by the CCT ca camera is already a big sign that the person, which is myself here, is trying to de-escalate the situation. Exactly. So I'm actually just preventing this person from coming close in the first place. And that's very, very important. I can't stress enough how important that is. This in itself, used together with voice control and shouting to the person, can already de-escalate the situation and make them go away, okay? Another thing to look at is your stance. Uh, so a lot of the times we maybe, you know, it will happen suddenly out of nowhere. It's really important to have a staggered stance to be solid on your feet. Whenever we're in a situation where my legs are crossed or feet together, I'm not very stable. So if someone comes pushing, there's a very big likelihood I'm going to collapse to the floor, which is not what I want. So ideal scenario is to have a staggered stance. And if they start coming close, I put my hands up and start shouting for them to move away. You can use uh, phrases such as go back, uh, don't touch me, go away, things that have very strong phonetic um, impact on that person. So that's framing and distance control. From here, if someone comes bringing their hands, maybe trying to grab me or maybe even grab me from the side or even punch me or let's assume this is a case scenario where he's, uh, the hand is coming at me, I can use very simple blocks. So the idea of a block comes from inside control. So I don't want to have my hands to the outside. I want to have my hands to the inside if I'm thinking of blocking, why? Because I'm still trying to protect my face. So my hands have to be relatively close to me. So in case the, the punch comes at the face, I have my elbows closed. So she's coming right and left and I use very simple blocks up and down using my forearm in the, at a 45 degree angle to make sure that that person does not touch my face. So one more time, one, two, and just watch my stance is still solid with a staggered stance. If the punch is coming a little bit lower, I can use the same block, but this time my arm is facing down. It's still at an angle. So she goes the other way. Exactly. Let's just pause there for a second to, for everyone to see this angle. That's it. So look, my hand is still blocking from insides. Okay. 
So it's not outside, it's inside. And then the other side will be exactly the same. So we have four blocks. If you do have someone in your household, you would like to, to practice this drill on, start very slowly and ask them to target different areas of your body and then just move into the blocks, one, two, three, four, four planes of motion. Sometimes the attack, the attack very rarely, but it can come from overhead or from underneath. Um, situation maybe in trauma, someone tries to grab your hair. I'm gonna use a block bringing my hand over oh, like this and crossing my arms. So wrist crossing. Maybe someone's trying to throw an object, uh, most likely grabbing the hair. So one more time, I bring my hands up and they're in a crossed manner like this. Now, similarly, if maybe I have a bag on me and someone's trying to grab the bag, I use the cross by bringing my hands down and moving my hips away. So this is the move I'm trying to, to do. Move myself away and crossed arms defending. This potentially could also be a knife defense. If someone's coming with a knife, I use this type of a block. So we have six blocks effectively. Okay, so let's just recap them. One, two, then lower blocks, three, four, high block, five, and low block, six. This is something a nice reflex to really can practice if you ever wanted to try it out. Now, most commonly, talking with people who've been massage therapists or working for the NHS and hospitals, most likely scenario you come across uh, are wrist grabs, actually. <laughs> so wrist grabs can be uh, different depending whether it's in the street or maybe, maybe you're in close contact with somebody and someone just grabs your wrist. Now, depending on the intention of the person and maybe, you know, a slight grab, and most of the time it won't be too strong, and using a circular way of moving your arm can actually break that grip. So if she grabs me, I move my hand to the outside and circle her in to get the hand out of the way. So it won't be too difficult. If the grab is a little bit more powerful, for example, the person grabs with both hands, I won't be able to use the same defense here. So this is a little bit more, I would say advanced, where right now I'm thinking this is, this is a little bit dangerous. This is something not quite right, uh, sending a red flag signal. So there's two things I could do. I could bring my hands together with my palm facing up and drag my hand out of the way, bringing the elbow up. So I'm essentially doing this, bringing my hand on top of the other and bringing the elbow up. This is leverage based. So even if someone's really strong, this should really work. So hands together, elbow up. An alternative to that could also be a hit in the groin. It could also be just a follow up. So perhaps I cannot break it. I use a groin kick and then release myself and always push back and create distance, okay? So wrist grabs, again, use your common sense and think what is the actual situation? Because if it's somebody just trying to, you know, stroke your, stroke your hand, not necessarily drag you anywhere, what could be enough is just to assertively um, tell what you don't want. So just, you know, be careful in looking after your boundaries. So telling the person, please do not touch me. And you can keep repeating this message until they stop. And most often than not, they will. Uh, from a lot of stories I've heard uh, from, from, from different clients I've worked with, um, confidence and asserting what you do not want can actually just take you away from that dangerous situation. Obviously, when you're working with, with somebody and you don't feel comfortable del delivering a massage for them, you can just always ask them to leave. Okay, keep repeating yourself until they do so. Um, Second thing I wanted to address um, is the use of palm strikes. So this is something we've seen in one of the pictures. So if someone comes really close and I was a little bit late, so for example, yeah, they're starting to touch me or grab me or maybe even connect with my throat, whichever the scenario is, I can use the palm strike using that part of my palm to bring underneath my partner's or opponent's chin. In this case, I bring it underneath the chin or right underneath the nose. So I very gently press and from underneath her chin upwards and look what happens with her posture. Immediately she's bending backwards. So this is creating the window of opportunity we've talked about earlier to allow us to escape from the threat. So one more time as she comes in, I can reach here, right? So I can reach over and then quickly move back or 
again, follow up with a strike. So as I move, I can follow up with a groin kick and then run away from the situation. Okay, so that, that is a really powerful, not necessarily punch, but a lever, leverage based move. And I want to move in a diagonal direction. I'm not moving forwards with my arm. I'm moving diagonally upwards because I'm essentially bringing these, the, the, that person's um, torso backwards like so. A couple of other things I promised to mention are elbow strikes and knee strikes. Elbow strikes will be delivered from close range. So we're talking about a scenario where I'm not that far away. I'm a little bit close now. Say maybe I'm against the wall. There's no exit route and I really have to defend myself. Elbows and knees are the safest parts of the, on your body that you can use against an attacker. Two ranges of motion for the elbows. If someone grabs me like that, I can use my elbow coming from down towards up, towards the ceiling. So here I'm actually tr triggered, um, targeting also the chin area. So if I bring my elbow from here all the way up or back elbow all the way up, I can actually knock someone out with this simple punch. This chin area is super vulnerable. So if you do it from the backhand, it has a little bit more momentum, but you can obviously use both elbows to bring those upper strikes into the human body on the chin right underneath it. Second type of motion where you can do with your elbows is to the side. So let's say this time maybe I'm, I'm not able to, to target the chin. However, I see the temples and the chin on the side are open. I can use my elbow in a sideways, sideways direction to target these areas, okay? So elbows over here usually be more situational when they're, they're a little bit closer to you. Exactly, so their face is a little bit closer. This is when it's going to be more, most applicable. Knee strikes, similar. This is more close range. So someone comes attacking me. For here, I will use the back leg because I have a little bit more momentum if I use the front knee, it doesn't have that much power. What I personally like to do um, when I'm wrestling with people or practicing my moves, I actually like to use their weights, whether bringing my hands on top of their hands or shoulders to frame. And actually now I'm helping myself because this is my anchor. And I'm then using this as my lever to bring my knee up. Okay, so I'm using it not so much, sorry, as a lever, but more like a base. This is my base. So even if they come at my throat, I, I bring my hands over, over their um, sorry, uh, forearms and I will strike with the back knee into the groin. Uh, if it's further away, I can strike with my foot or I can bring myself a little bit closer and just follow up with the same back knee strike, always from the back knee. It's more powerful, has more momentum. Um, and obviously you can follow up with another strike. So what it means, you can do two knees or a knee with an elbow. So let's play a scenario. <laughs> She's here. I'm trying to do a palm strike on the chin. Maybe it doesn't work. I follow up with the knee in the groin. Maybe it doesn't work. Here I use the elbow into the chin and she goes. I create distance, frame my hands and move away from conflict. Okay, so we've discussed palm strikes, blocks. Uh, we've discussed hitting the groin, hitting the chin, uh, there's also a couple of things, <laughs> ears I mentioned already. There's also two vulnerable parts of their her, her body here. One, I can use my fingers against the throat. This little area here is going to create distance. This is more from close range. If I cannot get out of the scenario, I can push away into this area in, in the throat. Okay. Again, this is not very harmful, but it just creates distance. So this I would use and then maybe a list a bit less harmful scenario if someone is just maybe like, you know, not necessarily attacking you per se, but you wanna move them away, you can target this area. Uh, and the second one, I think we haven't discussed yet, are the eyes. So I'm gonna bring my thumbs in, four fingers to the outside. If you go down a little bit, everyone can see the camera. <laughs> and thumbs into the eyes. This is last case scenario, obviously. Uh, and this is if everything else fails, if you're really close range and you can't do anything with your hands and legs, you can use your fingers to target these areas, throat, ears, and eyes, okay? Last but not least, you can use improvised objects. So whatever you may have at hand, um, this is probably the most common one since we're in the UK, okay? 
if you have something at hand and you feel like you're scared to defend yourself, use it, use it as an improvised weapon, whether to create distance or whether to hit with that object. Um, you know, pepper spray isn't legal in the UK um, and a bunch of other weapons aren't legal either, but you can use objects um, in the line of defense as well. So just thinking about that as well. Um, I think I've covered pretty much the basics of what I plan to do. Thank you, Isabella. <laughs> so I will welcome any questions now um, with regards to the presentation itself, but perhaps also with anything else that we have not covered today. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Joanna. <laughs> <laughs> My screen went just went off for a minute. That was really, really instructive. I mean, from my point, having talked to quite a lot of therapists over the years, um, I'm interested in your feedback. When you get people coming to to your your workshops or saying, "I need to know something about self defence," do you find that people who tend to be more mobile working people or people who ha are working from a fixed place? It depends. It's usually groups and each one of the groups has the, the individuals within that group will have different experience. So it usually will be a mix um, with with self defense workshops. I have more groups than individual people. Uh, when it comes to individuals, it's usually people who have been unfortunately um, victims of assault already. So they're coming into me directly because of something that has happened. Um, and it's, again, it, it, it ranges from something that happened in the streets a lot of the times, not necessarily in therapy room. That's, let I would say, less, uh, less common. Uh, most common would be something, um, yeah, not necessarily with the workplace. Yeah. I think the most shocking um, statistic you gave was increase of 15%. That is absolutely yeah. shocking. It is. Yeah, it's a big increase. And again, I know that there is more awareness around it, more reporting around it, but still, uh, I think it is on the rise through social media because people are now are able to track where, where other people attend, where they go, through hashtags, through stories, um, and all of that has just become a little bit more available. And so people have a little bit more knowledge about your personal life, unfortunately. So I think the awareness factor for us would be to make sure that we don't maybe share it with a wider audience, but rather only with people who are close to us and who we trust. Uh, that would be probably my first advice in terms of sharing your, um, you know, your, your social life mm -hmm. with others. I think, I think you're, totally right and sometimes people are very naive unfortunately so and a lot of the times i also mentioned that harassment uh, mm. piece because uh, that happened to me so many times uh, and more often than not at the beginning i wasn't actually reacting towards it and so what would very quickly just escalate and escalate uh, and right now i kind of have that routine where i immediately ban that person or report them <laughs> or um, block them and or um, if, if they're very being like uh, contacting me from different numbers and being quite aggressive in their approach, mm -hmm. I immediately uh, threaten to report them to the police. Um, yeah. I don't always report to the police, I'll be honest, because let's face it, police doesn't always have that um, capacity to deal with every single you know, harassment call or harassment text message, uh, they don't have that bandwidth. But um, but for me to feel safe and feel assertive enough to tell that person, I'm actually happy to go to the police and act um, and, and tell other people what you're doing, um, I have very good success rate with that <laughs> message. So yeah, yeah that works. I, yeah, I mean, I can see that the encouraging understanding how you can actually be effective with your body is going to build a huge amount of confidence in people. Yes, yes I think this is the biggest problem with, with uh, working with people in self-defense is that they're actually scared to, to, to physically do anything. <laughs> they're, they're also scared to use their voice, they're scared to, um, to act in a certain way. That I keep saying this over and over again because I cannot stress it enough how important it is to really be confident enough just to tell that person I don't want you to touch me I want you to go away and yeah often than not that that is already like that measure that's going to help us and save us from danger 
Um, obviously, there are scenarios where it's higher impact, where we have no no choice but to defend defend ourselves. Um, but again, this is going to go down to how confident you are within your body. Um, mm -hmm. So it's unless you you train your body in a certain way, it doesn't have to be necessarily one particular martial art, but anything really that make will make you feel empowered. Obviously, I'm biased for jujitsu, but it could be anything like boxing, even cardio boxing, anything where you mm -hmm. engage with other people and kind of, um, you know, use your reflexes, use use the body to kind of understand how the body moves and what you can do, because there are a lot of things you still can do, even as a smaller person. Uh, I train with with people who are much stronger than me, much bigger than me, and I can still I still still see the application of that technique and how much it can do. So. Yeah, I mean, you, you see videos of some of the really tiny, tiny Japanese women overpowering enormous, enormous yeah. opponents. So, yeah, and I think, again, the, 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 again, the really key word that you brought up is learn to be assertive. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because you're immediately changing the dynamics. Simply by being assertive, it's, it's kind of something that almost isn't expected. You're changing the direction of travel 100 percent, 100 percent, and this is something that it's not necessarily ingrained in it's partially ingrained in our dna but most often than not is taught and learned so this is something you can improve uh i'm i am an example of that i <laughs> didn't used to be very assertive and i'm still learning how to be but you can with practice you can really improve your uh, level of assertiveness and confidence Absolutely, I think that's really useful. Joanna, can you just remind everybody of, of your your um, how people can get in touch with you? Absolutely. Um, so perhaps I'll just share my screen for a second here. Um, this is my website, uh, www.womenselfdefense.com. Um, yeah, you can see it on the slide over here, co.uk. There you go. Um, so that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. Um, I think the simplest way. So you can make a note of that. And yeah, I'm be more than happy to answer any questions that may, you know, come after that seminar, after that workshop, because I'm aware that some people will be watching it at a later date. So they, they will. And I think again, it's the kind of thing if you you know watching it, you can actually pause it and then rewind. And then mm -hmm. that's how you begin to take it in. So is your email something like just info at women's self-defense or? Uh, my, uh, my email at the moment is joanna.boxing at gmail.com. Oh, you okay mm -hmm. that's being shared? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes. So I'm just putting that in the chat box. Joanna. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll can put it as well here. Yeah. Perfect. Joanna, thank you. Thank you so much. Again, I think yours is the, 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 the presentation that people will just watch, stop, pause, rewind, take in. And then um, are you running classes online or just or just in any particular place? Oh, yes. I'm based in West London, but I do a lot of online classes as well. That's for individual individuals and groups. Um, so yeah, definitely. Uh, this is something I can do if someone is based further away. You can do a lot online too. That's wonderful. Joanna, thank you so much for sharing some of that. With Very that. welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure because it's the kind of thing that makes a difference to people's lives. It really is. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank <laughs> okay. You. Bye, Joanna. Bye. Okay, so um, we now have 15.